Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Brass. And today we're going to have a discussion on free will, libertarianism, determinism, and the like. Joining me today is two of um, who I consider my friends. In one corner, we have Eric, the philosophy tiger. And in the other corner, we have Kyle from Christian Idealism. How are you two doing today? I'm good. I'm I'm doing well. Uh, COVID lockdown. Yeah, we're all dealing with COVID, so. <laughs> yeah. So, for my audience that does, if they do or do not know, what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be having an informal discussion regarding the topic of libertarian free will and free will in general. Um, it's not a formal debate. And I'm hoping just to have an exchange of ideas here. Um, I'm mostly going to be sticking it out and letting my friends here discuss it together. Um, to go first, um, Philosophy Tiger, tell us, um, tell the audience about yourself. Hi there. Um, so basically, I am a uh, I'm an upcoming. Uh, uh, reform, uh, reform theological ph philosopher. I deal. Uh, my in, my number one interest, actually, I found it very fascinating, is uh, self deception. <clears throat> so I do. Uh, right now, I'm studying a lot of uh, issues on psychology and uh, things about epistemology and also uh, issues of logic. I mean. I have a lot of time on my hands, and then I'm also uh, reading through Von Till's Apologetic and whatnot. Um, uh, I also am reading uh, a history of, of Western philosophy from IVP Academic. Very, very good stuff. I actually do enjoy it. Um, academic background, I have a master's degree from the University of Central Florida, a master's from uh, Southern New Hampshire University. I plan on getting my PhD in either philosophy or theology in Europe. Uh, um, and then I will also, and as far as personal background, I am actually from uh, from Southern California. Uh, and um, so I just say SoCal because most people don't know the, the city that I grew up in. Um, but uh, basically I moved out to the East Coast uh, back when I was in my late teens and then I was there, I was in uh, Florida for a little over 13 years and I've just moved to, to, uh, to the American South proper, uh, uh, kind of the Georgia, uh, Ar Arkansas, Alabama area, that kind of thing. And, um, so while COVID's going on, I'm, uh, I'm going to start working on some short stories and I'm also going to do a couple critical pieces as, uh, as I can get a hold of resources. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, with COVID and everything going on, that stuff is kind of slow at this point. So anyways, that is, uh, that's it. I don't, uh, I don't do a whole lot of talk about uh, personal life. Uh, Derek, kind of knows more about my personal life because we're good friends. Uh, and then, um, but if we want any questions answered, just let me know. All right. That's good to hear. Um, now, next up, now, while Kyle has been on my channel before, he um, just, to, I want Kyle to, you know, go over a bit about him, his background, and what does he do on YouTube? All right, the floor is yours, Kyle. All right, my name is uh, Kyle Allender. Um, some of you, well, most of you know me as uh, Christian Idealism, and I run a, so far I'm running a YouTube channel. It's more about, I focus on like philosophy of mind. I'm also going to get, start to get a little more into uh, philosophy of religion and arguments for and against God. Um, I don't really have a background per se. Um, I graduated from high school. Um, right now I'm in college, and I'm hoping to get a philosophy degree eventually, but we'll see how that goes. So in terms of um, what I study, I'm just 
kind of the layman type of person. I guess you can call me more of like a credible layman because I try to, I don't just read, you know, the stuff I read is very academic. It's also very, like it's top level philosophy stuff. Um, so depending on how much money I have, how much I'm willing to pay for a philosophy book, I'll get it and read it. Um, so in terms of, you know, I don't have any fancy degrees or anything, but I do know philosophy pretty well. Um, I've studied it for a few years. Um, and as far as my YouTube channel goes, I just kind of make, you know, just regular lemon videos, not, nothing really complex. Um, and I'm hoping that further down the line that uh, I could start getting into academia, but we'll see how that goes. Um, as far as my personal life goes, not really much. Um, just regular old college student that's trying to get by, especially right now during COVID. Um, so the best I can do is um, just live it out. And, you know, I get, at least right now I'm, I'm uh, studying a lot more than I normally do. So that's a good thing. But I understand there's a lot more. It's a lot more I have to learn, right? And so, um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. So what we're going to do now is, you know, I want you both to briefly lay out what your position is regarding free will. Um, I'll let, since you just went, Kyle, I'll let philosophy Tiger here give a brief synopsis on, you know, what his position is and then you can go tell yours. And then after that, you know, we'll begin with an informal discussion. All right. Okay, so uh, basically I myself uh, take a uh, a um uh, a classical Hebraic uh, position on uh, free will in that uh, God is in complete control, that humans actually do have a will, but we have a, an evil and good inclination, and that is actually found with, uh, with an understanding of the Greek beyond uh, what Augustine understood it as. I mean, Augustine didn't know Greek very well, uh, although he did good, he did good uh, based on what he had. Um, but uh, basically, the uh, uh, my position is that the scriptures actually hold to a more of a communal uh, position, and that they are also uh, the scriptures themselves uh, hold uh, to a magisterial position. And so, I take more the magisterial Protestant position uh, on this matter. Um, now. That does not, and the the thing that I uh, I, I give a caveat on that is uh, libertarianism uh, today is um, they think of the word, but I, I would say the word itself has been stretched to almost being useless. It's a uh, it is it's a spectrum. It's a it's a very broad spectrum, and. Uh, so libertarianism itself, within it, you'll like for example, George, Georgism, for example, is more agricultural, and it does have very localized government. Uh, and then there's other there's other ones on that that I just can't, I won't have time to to uh, discuss. Uh, I wanted to give I I basically went in here on blank on on libertarianism because I really just want to get the position of Kyle here. Uh, and that's what I would rather do, like I say, than, uh, than just give rebuttals here and there. Uh, I, I actually want to have the facts of his position on, on the floor. That's it. All right. So now it's your turn, Kyle. Give a brief synopsis of your take on it. And after that, we'll begin the informal discussion. Okay. Well, um, so my position... I don't hold to political libertarianism, so um, I'm going to take more of a philosophical perspective on um, that sort of thing. Now, libertarian free will, I don't, I don't know why people, I mean, I call it that, but at least, I guess you could say that libertarian free will is basically the thesis that human beings um, have um, some deliberate action or some deliberate choice in their decision making um now there are there are actually distinctions within um the libertarian view just as in 
So if you if you were to kind of like compare it, so basically you have libertarianism and then determinism, which just says determinism has a soft and hard version. Um, libertarianism would also have a hard and soft version. Um, so my personal take, my personal position is simply I'm a soft libertarian, which means that I do think that um, there are things in nature, um, what do you want to call it, like, um, let's say personal desires or, um, you know, psychological influences that can influence someone's free choice, um, right? But then at the end, but ultimately, um, while they can influence um, an agent's free choice, it doesn't actually determine their free choice. So it's kind of like, you know, if you were to talk to a celebrity, like a celebrity could influence you to do a certain thing, but the celebrity doesn't have control over your will. In the same way, um, human beings have control over their own wills. While there are other things that can influence their wills, like let's say if they have some reason to make a choice or something like that. The reason didn't cause the choice in that sort of way. The agent ultimately still had the final decision in the manner. Um, so that's that's my take on free will. And then there's I also make a distinction between what's called um, meta free will versus just um, mundane free will. But I guess we can get more. In, I'll get I'll kind of explain that more a little later. But um, but yeah, that's that's my position. I, I'm a I would be called what's called a soft libertarian. So. All right, that's cool. All right, so now we're going to begin the informal discussion on the topic. You are free to ask each other questions, grill each other a little bit on each other's positions. Um, I will say, though, you know, no screaming, nothing like that. Keep it professional. And, yeah, so outside of that, you guys can go right ahead. All right. Um, I didn't write down any questions, so I'm just going off the top of my head. Um, you mentioned political libertarianism, but I thought this discussion was about um, philosophical libertarianism. I was well, well, the uh, when it comes down to philosophy, it's such a it's such a broad topic that uh, the one thing we have to remember is uh, our actions really are dictated or. Uh, very much dictated by our worldviews, um, and worldviews basically themselves are uh, are our ideologies. They're made up of presuppositions that are our our, our ultimate commitments, and they're not just any uh, any sort of uh, uh, any sort of just uh, random opinion. They are they're they're the ultimate commitments that we hold to, and they are the hardest to change. No, Ray, I agree. Um, so libertarian free will doesn't deny that there would be some, like, it doesn't deny that people have beliefs, right? So, um, let's say if, let's say if there's an, like, let's say, um, an ideology of like a flat earth theory, right? Um, oh God, some, oh God. Some, sometimes you may have people that, and I'm just using this as an example, but it, it shows why, you're right that I'm just busting your chops. Some ideology can have an influence. So, like, even if you were to sow a flat Earth, or like, if you were bringing them up the space and actually show them the globe Earth, they would, they still wouldn't accept it, right? Um, because they would say oh, they'll make up some excuse, like, oh, well, you you gave me a drug, or I'm I'm in a I'm in a simulation, or whatever. Um, they they won't actually accept what they're actually yeah. saying. Um, yeah, that would be called ad hoc. Right, and so. I do agree with you that human beings are irrational in that sort of way, where even if you were to show them evidence for some belief or something, right, if you were to show why their belief is wrong, um, that could definitely, it's, it'll be hard for them to accept that that belief is wrong, right, because they have this ideology. Now, in that case, I wouldn't, here's the thing with that is, how is it that an ideology in and of itself can cause somebody to make certain choices like they could like certainly it could influence their choices right um like a flat earther may be more willing to go out and protest you know about the globe earth or whatever um or be online all the time um but 
none of that actually causes their choice. They're still making that choice. It's just there's there's influences that kind of influence the choice in the same way of, um, you know, if if you were to talk with a Republican or a Democrat, like their their choices within politics is going to or their beliefs in politics, whatever their political view is, is going to influence their choices. But the choices are still theirs. It's still their choice. It's just there's obviously prior influences that influence those choices. So, Yeah. And so what, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to give a solid uh, definition. And I, it took me uh, some reading to... <laughs> You don't want to do Hodge if you're if you're not into into reading a lot. Um, but Hodge uh, does say a very solid definition of of systematic theology, where he says theology is the uh, is the science of the fact uh, of the facts of divine revelation so far as the, those facts concern uh, the nature of God and a revel and a relation uh, to Him as creatures, as sinners, and as the subjects of redemption. And so <clears throat> the uh, so. In in the in the biblical text, we understand that uh, in the biblical text, we understand as Paul states that uh, we are uh, that everyone is evil. There is not one good person, and uh, that uh, that you know our e our evil inclination our evil inclination has an absolute uh, uh, influence on us. So the the big thing that uh, comes down to that is uh, so these are our starting points. Uh, the, this is the starting definition I'm going with, and sorry, go okay. away. Um, so the, I'm I'm not a techie. I'm trust me. I'm touch I'm touching a tablet here, um, <laughs> and so um, so so basically uh, the 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 huge uh, the huge impact that has is okay. Um, now you're bringing up uh, political philosophy. Now it, the big question is how does uh, so, how does an individual uh, interact within uh, within the scope of said political philosophy? Get what I'm saying? Yeah. No, yeah, I'm not. Well, actually, I'm not. A, I'm not a libertarian in the political sense, so I just want to make that clear. So, okay, okay, yeah, and so we we base. I think we, you know, when it, it's I, I have no problem with uh, with goof ups and communication. I think that was just a, a goof on my part. So I'll just let I'll let you continue. Um, so let's uh, um, yeah, let's go ahead and let you hash out some more because, like I say, I'm gonna. You know, I, I'm a real big talker and I can yak a long time. I just I really want to get to know. Not so I, I want to get to know your side of things and mine. I can give people many, many resources left and right. They can they can even go to Calvin. They can go to Augustine and, and they can go to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Uh, or the Westminster Confession, whatever you want. Um, you're you're kind of new to me, and I don't want to misrepresent your position. No, yeah. Okay. So um, my position, I so there actually are a few things I would agree with Calvinist on, um, but I'm going to go over kind of, I guess, my position and see if you would disagree with anything. So when it comes to um, Let's just start off with um, the nature, like I, what's I already disagree with you. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay. okay, let's start off with what's God's role in in the world, right? So this is what's called. Um, I th I think it's I can't remember the exact name. I might get this wrong, but it's called um, providence, right? So how much control does God yep. actually have um, in the world? And I do think that God does have control. Um, but he doesn't have control over the will. Rather, he has control over um, the circumstances or he he decided to... Uh, so I guess you could say I take a more of a Molinist approach to things. So God kind of chose to create a particular world. And from that, he kind of used um, creatures' freedoms 
um, to develop a world where there is the least amount of evil now. That goes into a whole different subject, which is the problem of evil, which is somewhat relevant, but I'll, I'll get to that. I guess we can discuss that later. Um, but basically, I would take a Molinist approach to um, predestination and all that good stuff. Um, so I, I would say that God can use what's called his middle knowledge or his knowledge of what could have happened and use that to create particular worlds. Um, now, when it comes now, that's the first part on that. So the second part has to do with um, hu human uh, depravity, which is another way of talking about the um, the fallenness of mankind. Now, this is actually something that I would agree with the Calvinist on. Um, to to a certain extent, I would say that yes, we are right to point out that mankind is fallen, that they are depraved. Now, I wouldn't go the total full total depravity route, but I would go what's called a radical depravity route, where basically human beings are radically depraved, meaning we are naturally going to sin. We are naturally going, um, and there's nothing within our wills, at least within our natures where we can stop sinning in a free sense. Now, the reason for that, my view is in a nutshell, it has nothing to do with God. It's just the nature of how the fallen state works. So it's not that God causes the fallen state in that sort of way. It's more like we decided to reject God. And so that creates this fallen nature within us. Um, I have a whole metaphysical system and on that. Um, I, I actually did a, a series on quantum. It's called Quantum Hermeticism, and I basically lay out kind of my view of the fallen state. I'm not going to get too much into it here, but the basic concept, I guess you could say, is when we reject God um, through our own free will, then that will create um, this fallen nature within us, and so then we'll be more inclined to sin. Um so I would agree with the Calvinists that um, that human ma that mankind is sinful. It's just I wouldn't say that God causes us to sin, right? Rather, I would say that it's us that causes ourselves to sin. And so, in that sort of way, I guess you can think of it as um, like the mystery for the Calvinist seems to be why does God cause people to sin, but then he gets mad at when they sin. Well, that's for the Calvinists to, I guess, address. For the Arminians, or my position would simply be, the question is, why does why do why do humans sin? So it's not, we're not putting the mystery on God. We're not putting the mystery as, as to why does God cause sin, but they get mad at it. Rather, we're asking, why do humans sin at all? And I think that's, I think that's a better um, mystery to put on, right? Because, I mean, if we're going to be honest here, I think there are certain mysteries about theology that we should, you know, that we may not necessarily know how it works completely. So in that sort of way, I, I again, I would agree with the Calvinists on that. And then the third thing, um, I want to make an important distinction between um, meta free will and what's called just mundane free will, or just regular free will. So um, regular free will, just, I just, I guess you can just call it free will. Um, basically, that this just—it's basically like um, someone's everyday choices. So, like, let's say if I go to uh, McDonald's and I order something, like I made that free choice um, to do that, right? I may have had some desires to go to McDonald's and make that choice, but I still made that choice. Um, same thing with more serious decisions. Like, let's say if I decided to kill someone, um, obviously, again, I still made that choice. I still, I'm still responsible for that choice. It's just. You know, I may have had some um, depraved nature that made me, um, that influenced that choice, right? So we had to make that distinction. And so that's that's what you call free will. Now, meta-free will has to do more specifically with um, kind of the, I guess, the background um, within our minds. So basically, like, our desires, our beliefs, our goals, um, stuff like that. Um, and actually, there's a, there's a, there's a neuroscientist who's called, his name's Peter Ticey, and he actually goes into um, this, what he calls metaphorical. And the basic idea is that our brains, because of the choices that we made in the past, it's going to influence our future choices in, in the sense that it's going to influence our decision-making processes, and therefore 
we're going to uh, make certain choices that we would that we wouldn't have made um, if if we were to make a different line of choices. Um, so that's that's basic, I guess that's the basic concept behind uh, that distinction. Um, so I guess. Uh, this, sorry, you, you can go, but yeah, I was, I was done. But you both believe that we're all fallen and we can't get up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's actually I agree with the Calvinists on that point. So. Yeah, and well, you know, one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the one of the terms right here that I'm kind of I'm, I've always been interested in is apostol, and um, which is uh, which is used in the uh, New Testament uh, when, uh, in fact, uh, I think it was Peter that uh, pulled the stole the sword to unsheathe the sword, and. Um, and so basically it's used always in a violent manner. And one thing I found very interesting is the same root word in, is used in its form with the father, where the father actually doesn't just woo you. He beats your ass, so to speak, and, and drags you. Um, not in a physical sense, but uh, it's, it is a violent term. It's always used in, in a sense of warfare. Um, and so, um, and so, even in spiritual warfare, such as where it says any any drew, any uh, any withdrew uh, from them about uh, in Luke uh, 20, 22, verse uh, forty one, even though that wasn't a physical violence, Jesus uh, was committing a spiritual violence with by withdrawing from them. Um, so that being said. Uh, would you agree that um, that the father himself ha doesn't have to um, so-called respect our human will, that he can actually uh, press his will upon us and we are not able to resist it? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. So... Actually, let me, uh, I don't have, okay, I, I guess my friend didn't, uh, he didn't do Irreducible Grace yet, so I can't, I don't have notes for that. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a certain sense in which God can influence our decisions, right? Um, and I'm sure there are circumstances in which God could um, make us irreduce, or I guess, there, there, he, he brings like a, such a strong influence on us that we have to choose a, a certain thing, right, or a certain choice, um, but I don't think that occurs all the time, right? Um, I think there are many examples in Scripture um, where um, basically that there that people can reject God, uh, that there's no real irresistible grace in the, the strong sense. Like there may be irresistible grace in certain circumstances, but um, there doesn't seem to be. Um, irresistible grace in every circumstance right um so let me see if i can but yeah go on uh so like the part where uh where fair where <clears throat> where uh where the king was told by god uh you know i kept i'm the one that kept you from sinning against me um it would would that apply here no right but i i would say that um we have a moral responsibility to not resist God, right? Um, but I wouldn't say that, um, like, I'm sure, like, God influences us to not resist him, right? But he wouldn't, I wouldn't say that um, he, he does that in every circumstance, because there are many examples in Scripture where um, there are, like, it does. It just there's <laughs> irresistible grace. Just doesn't work with certain passages. Um, at least if you're gonna, I, mean, I guess if you're gonna take a, a literal approach, right? So if you look at um, if you look at Acts seven fifty one, for example, um, that's that's one of the verses I go to. And there's what is the, what is the verse again, please? Acts seven fifty one. Let's let's focus on Acts seven fifty one. Okay. The, 
reason I, I go with uh, go with uh, focusing on, uh, uh, trust me, I, I think I think this uh, this thing is going to be. Kind of, I think this thing wants to be a center right here. Welcome to my tech. Um, it like it's not it's resisting me all right um okay so we're we're talking about uh the literal i'm just gonna go with what it literally says right here uh stiff necked and uncircumcised and hard and and ears uh you always the spirit ho holy resist as as the uh fathers of you uh also you wait hold on wait, wait, which passage are you uh 751 it's at yeah, so Acts chapter seven, um, verse fifty one. Are you at that one? It says because for me it says, um, you you stiff necked people, uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So now I know probably my translation is a little different than yours, but um, but I mean it does say like you can resist the Holy Spirit. Mm hmm. Yeah. So what, what do you what do you uh what do you think? Hello. Oh. I can't hear him. So. Oh. Yeah. Hear you guys. You there, Tiger? Hmm. Can you hear me so. now? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's oh, okay. Am I okay? So basic. Okay, gotcha. Now we're now we're we're uh we're we're gonna go with that. Okay, so let me let me review real quick because that is a that is actually a passage I did not uh, expect. But hey it happens and that's uh that's okay yeah i mean there's that's just one example i mean there's others i could mention but yeah yeah so i think he misses pretty good so far um yeah i mean i mean yeah i mean that's why irresistible grace honestly like if you if you, there's con there's verses plenty of verses that contradict it like and I've yeah, so I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I'm at, I'm looking at I'm looking at this, and it's actually in uh, the in the term it, the term itself is 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 also used in the way of, of crushing an enemy. Um, so are we saying that uh, are we saying that God can, are you saying that the Holy Spirit is getting crushed like an enemy, or what's going on right here? Well, not in the literal. Well, obviously, we can't crush the Holy Spirit, right? Because I mean, that's <laughs> he's God. Um, God cannot be crushed, right? Um, but what I'm what is basically pointed out is like our wills can re re reject God. That's the whole point. Um, well, it, it's not. It's not against the. It, have you like? It, and when it comes to irresistible grace, we're not talking about the the the. The, the reformed theologian is not going to be talking about uh, a that <clears throat> they're not really saying, hey, uh, you can't you're 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 going to you can't wage war against uh, you can't say things bad about him. You can't uh, you can't say things that you can't be against God. In fact, the, the point is we are against God. We are desperately wicked. And so when it, when it comes down to that right there, um, the big question is, are they, uh, are these people themselves actually, um, are these people themselves saved or are they, are they heathen? Well, I mean, it actually, um, it's funny because if you go back to, let's say Isaiah 610 or not 610, sorry, it's Isaiah 6310, um, Isaiah says that, um, for example, Israel rebelled and rejected the Holy Spirit, and so then you have basically. Yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with uh, I'm gonna stick with uh, verse 41 first because I wanna I wanna dig into this and then we can go to Isaiah. So yeah, um, I mean, basically, I make a little a more of a comparison. So 
um, basically you have a situation where you can resist the Holy Spirit, right? Um, that's just one example. And yeah. there's other examples where you, you can. And basically the idea is, um, it's kind of like, if you were to make a good analogy, you, I guess, it would be if as if it were, if like a child were to like argue with their parents, for example, um, obviously the parent isn't going to cause um, the child to make a decision or in that in that in that case rather the child has the ability to resist the parent um, in the same way we have the ability to resist god if we wanted to you know his grace is not going to okay, be so, irresistible so can can we go can we um let's i want to go with this part it says so i know this is uh kind of a longer reading than i usually want to but it says uh, starting at 44, our fathers, uh, our fathers had a tabernacle of, of, of testimony in, in the wilderness. I actually remember this passage now. Uh, just as he who spoke to Moses directly to him make, to make it according to the pattern which he had seen, and having received it in their in, in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua and upon dispossessing the nations uh, whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David uh, found fa favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for uh, God of J for the God of Jacob. But it was uh, Solomon who built the ha a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Uh, heaven is my throne and earth is the a footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my purpose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Uh, you, you men who are stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ear and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are just you are doing just as your fathers did. Which what which one of the prophets did your did your fathers not prof, prof, uh, persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose uh, betrayers and and murderers you have not now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. This he's not really talking. Uh, he's not talking to uh, people that God transformed. So. I mean, the position of the of the of the reform uh, the reform position itself is that God transforms uh, the heart, the heart of the of a wicked person, and it's upon that that He gifts them uh, faith, gifts them justification, and gifts them the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can, and it's not that we can't. It's not that we can't resist uh, the. The, the declarations of God, but upon the upon the motion that God uh, foreknew, which Proganisco and the Aorus tense, uh, that as Paul states it, um, it's a, it's upon it's upon that for ordination that we that people that are saved can't they will not resist that will they will hear that call and so. Um, I'm scratching my head right here well, as to the purpose of this of this passage. Well, I think it's pointed out that it actually is pointing out to sinners, right? And that sinners have the ability to resist the Holy Spirit. Um, I and think that's yeah, just, that's that, yeah, but that's, irresistible irresistible grace has to do with like tulip has to do with salvation. It's not. It doesn't have. It doesn't really have right. to. Right. But wouldn't you agree that uh, that the Holy Spirit is the one that brings that ir irresistible grace? I mean, if it's not the Holy Spirit, then what else is bringing that irresistible grace? I, I cited I cited the passage where the Father is the is the one that drags the person to to the cross, where the person is uh, the Father is the one that drags them to the cross, where they are justified, and upon justification, they're granted the Holy Spirit, who gives them th faith and and sanctification. Okay. So they're so so that's uh so I mean these actually harmonize very well. Hmm. Well, if that's the case, then why does the um I mean I would agree with you that the father is the one that uh kind of starts the process, right? Um but the the issue then oh, is he... why why does 
why does it mention the Holy Spirit then? If the Holy Spirit is going to be resisted in this circumstance, why couldn't the Father just bring his... Because if we're talking about irresistible grace, if so are you basically saying that the Father is not the one that can be resisted? Is that your... You yeah, and, but if you're if if you're looking if you're looking at Acts seven, Acts seven is actually is is Stephen's is Stephen's apologia against the uh, it's an apologetic it's an apologia a legal defense against the high council. So uh, he's basically this is a this is a rhetorical device where he's being very very sarcastic with them. He's basically saying. He's basically, it's basically saying you yourself can't even resist God. You can't even resist us. Uh, and that is true. You go further, uh, these, the, the uh, Judea council at that point in Jerusalem and in other areas too, could not, could not stop uh, God's foreordination for of the Christian religion spreading. Hmm. So this is actually a legal text. It's not a. It's not just. A, it's not really a good text to, to 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 position us on uh, to put a position on irresistible grace, because Stephen right here has already been saved irresistibly. Before that, interesting. Um, hmm. So I, I would kind of my and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not bashing on I'm, I'm just going to say yeah, yeah. I'm going to caution you on this because uh, Acts is <clears throat> so the, the caveat I give with give people with Acts is you need to read all of Luke because Luke is a historian. And then, so you can't just cite a little bit of him. You have to read the whole thing. And that's why exposition from, from Luke's two volumes, because Acts is actually part of, of the gospel of Luke. They're actually, it's one actually continuous history. And so Luke himself, when you cite, when you're going to cite Luke's work, you got to remember he, he, his stuff is a is a uh, is written in a in a very masterful way that the that high uh, highly educated Romans and Greeks would have written it if they were historians and they and basically uh, one of the big things that he was very interested in uh, as a physician were uh, were issues uh, such as such as as this uh, as this apologia, you don't really see uh, a, a systematic apologia in 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 Matthew, Mark, or even John. Uh, I think the closest you'll get to a systematic apologia uh, uh, along this line, and you get multiple of them in Acts, is is the Epistle to the Romans, and that's the most systematic of of Paul's thought that we have. So basically, your interpretation of the text would simply be that they haven't received the Father's grace. And so, okay, but so does the Holy Spirit have grace then? So you, the, you, the, they they all they all work. They are all the Holy. They they the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. The tr the the Son is God. But they all play a different function. Um, now we can't we can't say you know we will ever completely know the Trinity. That will be impossible. No, um, right. Yeah. So, so I guess, uh, I guess well, my my uh, issue then. Something. Sorry. Go ahead. You, okay. So my issue then would be like if you go to the author of Hebrews, for example, um, like he constantly tells them to not resist God. Um, but rather respond to God's gracious offer. So basically, it's God is offering us something, and it's uh, he's telling us who, who not he, to resist it. Right? Who is he writing so, to? Well, if you read if you read uh, Hebrews three, chapter three is verse. Um, it's verse eight is also verse fifteen. Um, uh, Hebrews okay, chapter who four. Is, no, no, no. Who is Hebrews being? Who was Hebrews written to? Talking about Israel, and they're basically the hardened hearts and all that stuff. Uh, okay, but, yeah. I get that, but who is it? 
written to not not snippets of what it who of uh, areas where it's about but to whom who's the audience let me see real quick hold on but, so uh well i'm not how is that relevant to the so how is that relevant to because the it uh, because the because the because when you're going to do an exegesis, you need to know the genre. You need to know the you need to know the audience. We need to get we need to speculate on on why uh, why the uh, the author wrote to the audience. Uh, we need to know the, uh, the historical time period. There's a lot that goes into exegesis, and uh, it is likely that it is a sermon to people that are already saved. So it's not about uh, it's not about resisting salvation per se, but the fact that we are ourselves when you actually systemize it with when you get a systematic theology of scripture as a whole, people that are people that are already under God's grace as as, as human beings, we are going to mess up. And so it is basically a way of saying don't don't go against his do not disobey his commandments but we will disobey those commandments and then uh we already have passages that say what's going to happen to the believer that a true believer that disobeys those commandments they're gonna be it's gonna be like it's gonna be like they're gonna feel like they committed murder uh so to speak and i'm, I'm using right. uh, hyperbole here and so yeah and so basically when you get back to when you get back to acts You'll find that the 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 the, um, the the high council itself was not having that kind of remorse. They were doing actually they were breaking God's law by uh, by doing what they were doing by lying uh, about these people. In fact, the where it says "Don't bear wit false witness against your neighbor" is it, it takes you know that part of the Ten Commandments to, is about is about how you handle courts you're not supposed to in a court of in a hebraic court of law it even the council is not is under god's judgment for for lying yeah. if the audience was let's just say that the audience was to um the unbelievers right so why wouldn't god use his irresistible grace in that circumstance because he's uh because god it it's <laughs> uh it's not because he doesn't have irresistible grace. It's that he actually chose the unbeliever. Sorry, he, he, choose, is, he chooses. Actually, so that, okay. like where it says he, God foreknew, that's where, that he, so God's, um, I can go with this one. So where Paul in Ephesians says God foreknew, uh, and it's a very rich, beautiful text, um, God foreknew uh, is is the aorist and active indicative of the proganisco uh, verb, where proganisco is uh, is an action oriented verb. In that knowledge is not some passive thing that we just obtain. Sorry, that God obtains. He is it's a he's an active force. His knowledge is an is a is is active. He's a he's a he's the right. He's the he's the uncaused cause, the causer, so to speak. Okay, so I guess we're actually we only have fifteen minutes left. Um, I was thinking we oh, could get know. into. Oh, go 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 ahead. I was thinking we could get into um, the philosophical perspective, right? Because um, actually, my objection, my best arguments against Calvinism are not actually scriptural arguments. Um, mine are more philosophical in nature. So basically. Okay. Okay. What I do is I provide kind of like it's kind of like um, the problem of evil, except like you know how the problem of evil is like a problem for Christianity, like it's inner, it's used as an um, inner critique of it. Well, it's the same sort of thing with uh, Calvinism, where there are certain points, um, yeah, certain and, arguments uh, that are kind of used to show why the whole system doesn't like it's but epistemically in, improbable. So I'm going to go with, um, but I'm going to go with the with the scriptures and where it says do 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 not go beyond what is written. So if I answer your your questions with with scripture and you being a Christian, you're still uh, you're still obliged to to obey these scriptures, yeah. Well, yeah, but in that case, I wouldn't say that the scriptures were written by a good God. 
I would say that um, if there was some divine force behind the scriptures, I I don't think that God would be um, the sort of being I, that I would want to worship. And then, uh, but then I would have to say, but by what standard is evil measured? With a yardstick. I wanted to I mean, go. Actually, I wanted to. Actually, I wanted to go with. I wanted to go with my my car and, and go a mile, dude. <laughs> oh oh oh! Just before we get yeah. back on the topic, we I used to actually have the we used to have this truck that we would actually this crappy truck when I was in the army, and we had to we had to go and and drive like two miles to make sure that the uh, that the that the soldiers were actually running two miles, and then we had to put all these this crap up. It was such a bad crap show. Well, when it comes to morality, I do I do think that um, God gave us some um, moral not intuitions, but I guess more reason. So basically, like if if morality is basically um, there's a I think there's a relationship between um, God's standard of goodness and our standard of goodness. Now there are there are definitely differences, right? But they're not radically different in the same sort of way. Like if God were to if if God were to do something evil in our eyes, it would be evil in, in any in the true sense, not simply by relativistic sense, but it would be just like if God like our understanding of goodness would also be the same as God's understanding of goodness. So if we say the Bible is true, if we say or if we say yeah, if we say the Bible is true, for example, then his truth and our truth are pretty much gonna be the same, meaning we have the same sort of understanding of truth. Um, it's the same thing with uh, morality, meaning our concept and our understanding of morality is going to be the same as God. So if if I think, for example, that it's wrong to torture babies, God's also going to think that. Now, there may be some disagreements, but we're going to have the same general idea of what morality is. Um, and would, would, you call, my, would you call that a natural revelation? Yeah, natural revelation, where basically there's... Um, there's like this relationship between our understanding of what's good and God's understanding of what's good, you know, and I think it's not just a, I think it's just a logical relation. So our understanding of what truth is, is also the same as what God's understanding of truth is. Um, and I'm not sure how, at least the Calvinist God, I'm not sure how the Calvinist God um, could be good if he is causing somebody to make um, a choice, like let's say, a, like let's say, if um, God were to cause, you know, control everything and c- control all the evil that happens in the world, right? So if God were to cause evil, I'm not sure how God would not be the originator of evil in that in that sort of way. Okay, so you would uh, you. So what about the determinate will and the descriptive will? Okay, can you, uh, I guess you want to clarify what that distinction is? So, so basic, so basically, uh, the scriptures actually show that God is in control of history. Would you say, would you say that? In some sense, though, not in, not an individual, like not people's actual choices, but, um, yeah, there's, I think, okay. I think when it comes to the whole narrative of like a savior and stuff, then yeah, I think God is a control um, of that because that's the process of how God gets us out of the fallen state. So in that sort of way, I think God is in control of history, but not all of history. Like God, I don't think God caused the Holocaust, for example. I think that's obviously um, absurd, but yeah. Yeah, so, but that goes back to the thing is that's where people get hung up on this is the descriptive will and the, and the, the descriptive will and the, and the prescriptive will and so uh, where God des- where God describes hit describes the, uh, the the path of history, and then He also uh, prescribes how you will follow that. Um, we're not we're not resistible. To, we can't resist either. Would you would you would you would you approve of that? What do you mean resist? Like, uh, hmm. what do you mean by so that? So for. So, for example, where the where the where the king or Pharaoh, whoever it was uh, in the Old Testament, where he had relations with uh, Sarah, 
he well he almost had relations with with Sarah and God was God struck him with 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 uh, with illness in his in his kingdom as well. Remember that part. Yeah. He he told he told the God that it's because of me that you did not uh, you did not sin against me. No, right. And I, I do think that uh, in, in that sort of way, like I believe in sanctification, right? So um, I do think that God helps us to get out of the fallen state, right? Um, he helps us to become more like him in that sort of way. Um, but I wouldn't, but I, I think my issue, it has not, it, my issue, I guess, it has nothing really to do with the holy state, which is the unfallen state. It has more to do with the fallen state itself. I think that God isn't the one that caused the fallen state, that we're the ones that kind of do that because of the consequence. It's basically like it's the consequences of um, rejecting mm-hmm. God or being separated from God. Um, and so but would you would you say that um, would you say that we that in one man uh, we died and then in in in, in, in one man we uh, we are we're born again? Well, yeah, I I do think um, like in like my well actually hmm because I I'm, I'm kind of mixed on this I'm kind of undecided on the whole original sin thing but if I were to pick what I think is the most probable position I don't hold to it necessarily but I think um, basically the fall of mankind so in other words you know when Adam and Eve ate the apple or whatever um, I think. That had to do with Adam and Eve not um, waiting for God's time. So I, I actually do think that there was going to come a point where they could actually eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The problem is they did it at the wrong time. They, they, they didn't they didn't do it the right way, basically. Um, but because they didn't do it the right way, because they didn't do because because they didn't do it in God's time, right? They did it in their time. Then the base. It's kind of like if you were to have. This is not the I I don't like it I don't like this analogy but this is the best analogy that I can give you. It's the same way of how sex works, right? Um, you're not supposed to have sex before marriage, okay? You're only supposed to have sex after your marriage, um, and so you have to do it in the right time, which is marriage. In the same way, you have to. They were going to eat from the fruit tree of knowledge of good and evil, but they had to do it at the right time, and they didn't. So that's kind of why they um, rejected God. And then on top of that, I do think that there was multiple falls. So I think if you look at the timeline of what happened, so if you, Adam and Eve, that was the first fall. The second fall was when Cain killed Abel. Then as you go down the generations, it gets worse and worse until you get to a point where it's like really bad. And that's why God had to send a flood. Um, So I, I do think that it's more progressive in that sort of way, um, and I do think that there was there was one fall, but then there were it kind of just got worse and worse over time. Um, and I think that was, I mean, honestly, I think that was just, I think that's just human nature. Um, and I think God realizes that that's that's human nature, and so He's trying to help us to get out of um, that that fallen state. Um, so yeah, that's that's that's. that's that's my view in a nutshell, but uh, but yeah. Okay, uh, I want to let you know that we're coming up on the around the hour mark. Uh, I'm hoping to wrap up by then. Yeah, yeah. So I can, yeah, okay. you can, uh, philosophy so, you can kind of respond what you think. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to let you guys have, you know, some of you know your final responses back to each other, and then I'll ask you guys later about uh, after that about. You know, each of projects you're going to do, and we'll hang it out. All right. All right, you go first, um, Tiger. You know, you're responding. Okay, so so ba- basically when it comes down to the Adam and Eve piece is that I kind of, I do disagree with it because the simple, uh, the, the grammatical construction of kabosh uh, in the in the words of do in Genesis 1, 28 does not actually allow for a, uh, for uh, immortality within the, and there's also other issues there too within the within the structure of it being a polemic as well, and uh, 
in Genesis one and uh, up into uh, up into Genesis two at the beginning. Um, so basically, kabosh itself uh, it's translated in the KJV as subdue, but uh, it is it, the kabosh itself is constantly used in either war, rape. Su subjugation through enslavement it's a very violent turn it's not benign and so uh god has basically uh, declared war on the on the animal kingdom uh through adam and eve uh another thing that is very important to uh understand is that uh the co that the cosmological temple of, of genesis 1 and yes, it is a cosmological temple, uh, had the Garden of Eden as the uh, as the Holy of Holies within that tabernacle. And uh, Adam, and then Adam was the was the high priest uh, within there. And because he actually uh, defiled uh, it through the sin of taking the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, he when God absolutely told him not to, that was the defilement, and that's the reason why he got kicked out of the Holy of Holies and, and sent out into the bitter wilderness. Um, now, as far as the uh, as the far as the tree of life, the reason why, uh, and we actually got this but through we get this through cross literary uh, analysis. Um, the reason why uh, God would actually uh, 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 put up a fly, a a an angelic being with a flying sword is to block them from the tree of life because the tree of life itself was the antidote to death, and so the blocking them was from that was the was the death sentence, and so uh, in fact uh, the so that that passage right there shows that God is in complete control of of uh of the of the co of of the cosmos and that is actually how the hebrews would have understood it um the a libertarian uh free will uh interpretation just doesn't do with uh the hebraic culture and the Meso mesopotamian area of that time i'm done Oh, and your final response, Kyle? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, a, I'm a theistic evolutionist, so I actually would agree with most of what you said there. You know, I do agree that it does mean subdue, and that means basically, you know, declaring war on uh, the animal kingdom. So I, I would agree with that. Um, I do not, I do not take the uh, young earth creationist interpretation. Um, so I do think that Adam and Eve were moral, mortal in that sort of way. Secondly, I do agree, um, again, that, uh, them not being able to have access to the tree of tree of life basically was a death sentence um so yeah i, I do agree with that as well um but i think it, it still goes back to i guess the point which is has to do with human nature right um and that i do think adam and eve still had this human nature within them and because they didn't do what they had to do at god's time um that's that's when, uh, because they wanted to become their own gods so in this sort of way, then that's basically what happened. And then as the generations went down and down, it just got continu continually worse and worse. Um, so at first, God kicked them out of the Holy of Holies. Then once Cain and Abel got killed, then it got worse, so they got kicked out. Um, it's actually, a, there's a good video by Inspiring Philosophy about this. Um, I don't, I'm not going to get into details, but that's basically my own view of that. Um, now, as far as God being in control, again, I would take a, a, a Molinist approach to all that. So I do think that uh, God is in control. I just don't think that God causes sin um, in the same sort of hard deterministic way or um, that sort of thing. But other than that, I mean, I, I would agree with most of what you said in your final statement. So, um, so yeah. All right. And now the informal debate is over, and we're going to go into the last part of this whole thing before we wrap up. And it's going to be, you know, you both give it, laying out what you're going to be doing, like future projects and the like. Um, like always, you can go first, um, Tiger. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to be writing a novel. Um, and now that sounds like it's going to be easy, that it's not going to take a whole lot of research. It really actually is a very, very uh, important that I, I do a lot of research for that because <laughs> if you're going to artistically, if you're going to take the, the spirit of a matter such as, let's say, uh, one of my favorite novels. It, it's so it's a simple novel, um, Pilgrim's Progress, and they're in two parts. Um, I have to know I have to know the material. I also have to know scientific research. I have to know philosophical research. I have to know a lot of that stuff in order to to artistically represent that material and be true to the spirit of it, while at the same time draw, driving a good story. <clears throat> um, I, as far as academic is concerned, at this point, I'm on a standstill, but I am looking at a university in Greece. I am also possibly going to do a university. I might do a university out in, in, Tel, in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, depending. Um, and if it's not a theological degree, if God doesn't want me to have that, uh, I hope, you know, I'm hoping to do uh, a philosophy degree I, in Europe somewhere. Uh, I've looked into Italy and I've also looked into France and maybe Spain will, will do, but I want to be as close to. And so um, basically one of my my big things I want to do with my dissertation is is discuss. Um, I kind of want to discuss the the theology of the theology of the self-deceived. And that's gonna be a deep topic that I have to develop over time. Um, a lot of people have asked me about it. And when I bring it up and they, and I, I have to be honest, it's gonna, you know, uh, a, a dissertation that's over three, <coughs> that's over 300 pages long, uh, it has to be molded. And um, anyways, that's, that's it. And, uh, um, any questions? Um, all right. Um, none for me. I would, now we're going to, for the last part, we're going to have Kyle reveal what he's planning on doing and the like. So you can go now, Kyle. All right. Um, I'm just, for me, um, I'm working on my, my next series is going to be called The Foundation Theory. And I basically basically going to argue that um that there's a foundation for reality um it, even if you have like an infinite multiverse or whatever um you're still going to have to have some foundation by which dependent things exist um and i'm going to get into like what the nature of this foundation is and i'm basically going to be arguing that this foundation is pretty much identical um to what we would consider as god um and so that would be quite interesting get, to get into that um, as far as after that, um, I'm also going to be going into um, probably Richard Swinburne's work on the existence of God, basically be arguing that theism is the best explanation for reality, um, so, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and then I got f further projects after that. Um, as far as my everything else, um, again, like I said in the beginning, um, I'm still in college, so, you know, I, I still got to got to finish my classes and all that good stuff but uh but yeah um youtube stuff's good and um, life is good in general um i just i just hope this pandemic ends like it's really getting annoying at this point but whatever um so yeah and then philosophy tiger um if you're interested i actually um i'm not very well versed so the topic today i wasn't very well versed in it like I should have been, so I do admit that uh, you made a lot of good points in our conversation. And but if if I would recommend somebody, I think is way better than I, than me on this topic would be David Pullman, and he he has a YouTube channel. He's made a lot of uh, interesting videos against Calvinism. I've had him on my channel once, but we didn't really discuss the scriptural stuff. Um, but so yeah, if you ever want to talk to anybody else, I would recommend um, David Pullman because he. He's a Armenian. He studies the stuff like a lot, a lot more than I do, because that's not my area of study. My area of study is mostly just uh, philosophy of mind and philosophy of religion, um, not really the Calvinist stuff. But I, again, I, I appreciate the conversation. 
Um, and so, yeah, that'll be that'll be it. All right. Well, that was this was a good informal discussion. I had a lot of fun listening to it and getting to chime in every now and then. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, this is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get washed.